here we go. All right, in the first session, you worked on data normalization, uh, looked into batch effect correction, and visualized your data in various ways. I do hope that you have a bit of more of an intuition how your data looks like, what's the structure of it, and how you can now work with it. All right, now we want to know which cell types you actually have. And we approach this task by clustering. Um, in ScanPy, we have the Louvain clustering enabled. Um, so that is a community detection algorithm um, that groups cells based on yeah, similarity. Um, Louvain clustering works actually on graphs and it compares um, a group, how many connections you have within this group um, to, um, it compares the connections within a group to the connections to another group. Um, and if you have fewer connections um, across groups, um, the Louvain algorithm makes a cut here and separates these two communities. Why is it called community detection? Well, um, graph objects and you can find everywhere. For example, the friendship graph of Facebook is one of these graph objects. And there every node is a person and every edge is a friend connection. So when I'm a friend to someone, I have a connection to this person. And now you can imagine that a population that speaks the same language and that lives in the same or a similar region has more connections um, to each other. Um, compared to a population that lives uh, on the other side of this planet. Or in different words, I have a lot of German friends, but I have really few uh, Vietnamese friends. So, and this is how Facebook groups you when you're a Facebook user um, into certain groups, just by similarity of your peers. Okay. So when we do this with our cells, we find the peers of our cells. And the Louvain clustering um, does not need a predefined number of um, groups that you want to find, but uh, it uses a so-called resolution parameter. So that defines how many cuts we actually want to make between groups. So here I depicted um, this PBMC data set and we have two different resolutions. So a low resolution leads to fewer clusters and a higher resolution leads to more clusters. The advantage of the Louvain clustering is that it scales well um, across different yeah, shapes of the data. So if you have a rare cell type, um, that's usually clustered separately from all other cells. Okay, now we use this uh, community detection algorithm to make sense of out of ourselves. So here we have two different types of clustering. Um, and now we can look at marker genes. So one way to look at marker genes is, for example, to color um, a humor by every marker gene that I can possibly imagine. Um, that, that gets already quite difficult to handle. It's a but it's a good way to yeah, get an idea about the data nonetheless. What you realize when you look at these kind of plots is that some markers are highly expressed and um, found in a really nicely defined group. Other markers, like this one below on the bottom row, um, it seems to be like all over the place and doesn't really um, define one particular um, cell type, but um, yeah, spreads out. So looking at this many U maps doesn't really help us and doesn't also doesn't really help us with identifying our clusters. So there's different ways to um, visualize gene expression in clusters. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the so-called dot plot. Um, the color of the dot is uh, the gene expression level 
and the size of the dot is um, the fraction of cells that actually express this marker. So a small dot means few cells in this cluster um, express the marker and a large dot means almost all cells express this marker. Um, now here for the PBMC example we can easily um, yeah, group our um, gene expression into the different um, groups and then check in every, every um, column how's the gene expression level for my marker and which cells does it correspond to. Um, and then we start to assign um, the cluster, yeah, the cluster name to the. Um, what you also see is, again, some markers are not really highly expressed. So when I can draw your attention to the CD8 T cells, we see that um, the markers CD8 A and B are really like lowly expressed, and also. Um, it's like half of the cells express the marker. So uh, this is what I would count as a, a weak marker. Um, and in contrast, if we look at the B cells, so we have the CD79 and this MSA4A1, um, most of the cells express it, the expression level is good, and we can see that almost none of the other cells actually express these markers, so that's super specific. Um, when we look at monocytes and dendritic cells, we also see that they tend to share markers. So these kind of markers are not super specific for um, one or the other cell type. When we want to look at um, the, not just the expression level and how many cells express it, we can also look at um, violin plots and, and then we also get an intuition of how the marker is distributed. Um, during the tutorial in the fourth session uh, we will also uh, look at other ways to visualize um, cluster information and gene expression um, such as heat maps and matrix plots. Cell type annotation is still something that you can only do manually. However, there are a couple of tools that um, help you to, to assign cluster names. Um, in, in ScanPy, we don't have them implemented. Um, so something that you can do is, for example, um, there's a tool called Garnet, that's an R tool. Um, that basically classifies your cells based on a marker gene set. So you define a marker gene set and um, tell the tool um, how the cells should be assigned to based on the marker gene expression and then the tool um, suggests an annotation for each cell. Um, I'm not super happy with this uh, approach because um, if you don't know your system very well, um, you tend to miss um, interesting cells or interesting populations. Um, that's why looking at the data manually is still tedious but um, rewarding because you get a good intuition on what the data looks like. Um, when you want to annotate 50 samples, uh, you might want to use something more automatic to just lift over your annotation. Okay, um, in this tutorial we will do a manual annotation. So you can spend a lot of time on um, yeah, looking at your data and check out marker genes. Okay. So the last topic of today is pseudo time and trajectory inference. So uh, here in the center, I depicted a manifold, so in a high dimensional space where our cells um, uh, live on, to be honest. So yeah, in simple words. Um, 
So every cell has a certain gene expression pattern and that's this uh, huge matrix here. Um, and now we can order the cells um, based on their transcriptomic profile. So then, and we want to, yeah, let's say, uncover the structure of the data and the structure of this manifold that we had in the high dimensional space. So now we want to draw a path through our data from one end to another and we use a so-called um, diffusion pseudo-time process that my colleague Lale developed um, and this is based on random work so we can um, take a starting cell and see how it um, how we can walk over each of these cells to an endpoint. Um, this is actually a metric and you can uh, use this metric to um, align the cells um, in so-called pseudo-time space. So this is like the order that you can give to each cell and then you can look at the gene dynamics that um, uncovers from these many random walks. Um, you can use this concept to determine bifurcations. So this is like either you walk to the left hand side or to the right hand side and then assign and see how um, the cells um, gene dynamics is changing over the different branches. And you can also look into the um, decision region to see which genes are actually um, changing in this um, yeah, population. Okay, um, so this um, bifurcation case is really specific. So um, my colleague um, Alex tended uh, tried to develop something more general. Um, and his goal was to um, connect all these uh, different um, yeah, settings that you can have. So um, sometimes you have discrete cell types. Um, so the data is more or less a discrete topology. Or you have a continuous phenotype, like changing from cell type A to cell type B. That's so-called line topology. Um, this is something that you usually have in the de developmental processes. Or you have a tree topology with multiple bifurcations. Um, you have the circle topology as you would encounter in the cell cycle. Or you have a complex topology as in a spatial position. So, and now can we unify this with one approach. Um, well, my colleague Alex succeeded in this um, and he used this single cell graph uh, representation of the data. So he represents the data as graph objects. So I have a cell and what are its nearest neighbors. And from this he can derive um, connectivity across the different clusters and see how many edges are spreading or spanning across clusters. So and the more connections you have between two clusters, the more yeah, similar they are, the, more, the closer they are. Um, and uh, this is now here reflected in the line thickness. Clusters that are not connected to any of the um, other class, clusters um, do not get an edge. Okay, um, that's the simple uh, concept. Um, and now we, uh, so Alex tried to apply this to the tissues of a complete organism. So, well, it's a planaria, so it's a flatworm. And the interesting thing about this flatworm is that it's um, in theory immortal. So it always has a pool of stem cells that continuously um, differentiate in all the different tissues that a worm has. 
um, the Paga model that connects the different clusters is stable under subclustering. So here we have the stem cells connected to all the major um, yeah, clusters and tissues. Uh, but we see the same thing when we subcluster the whole structure. And finally, this is how the data now looks like. And you can see that um, you have a multitude of different um, yeah, differentiation paths um, and it's difficult to um, yeah, actually assign a starting or an end point or to um, subset the whole data set into bifurcation. So this um, graph approach is uh, very general um, and has also been um, really successful in a huge benchmarking study um, on pseudotemporal um, algorithms. So In the fourth session, now I would uh, like you to annotate the clusters um, uh, of yourselves and make sense out of your data. Um, and if there's still time, you can also try out this uh, pseudo-time concept and also this Paga concept.